Um, so this is probably a little bit of a different type of a session than many of you guys have uh, been in sort of throughout the past few days. And, you know, inclusive design is a topic that uh, there's been a lot of discussion about. Um, but it's, it's a touchy topic sometimes. Um, so we have an amazing panel, and I think you're going to find the conversation is going to be um, pretty loose and free-flowing, and we're looking forward to um, some Q&A um, about that. I think, you know, for anyone here who doesn't spend all of their time thinking about inclusive design, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what inclusive design really is and how to shift our thinking um, from some of these like long-held beliefs that inclusive design is synonymous with accessibility, um, and it's not. There's some other things. Um, Joyce kind of brought up that accessibility sometimes felt like a tax that used to be at the end of development, and that you know there was kind of this um, overtone that if you didn't do it, that bad things could happen, sort of from a legal perspective. And really taking all of those old ideas and kind of pushing them off to the side and looking towards um, kind of new ways to reach new audiences. And there's a lot of energy around that. And I think, you know, everyone has probably seen that kind of statement, which is like, um, diversity and inclusion is good for business, right? So if that's true, diversity and inclusion are good for business, it's also good for people and it's also good for product development. So, you know, kind of before we get into it, just to introduce myself uh, briefly, this is my first build um, conference. Uh, my name is Pam Scheidler. I'm the chief digital officer at a creative agency in LA called Deutsch. We work with lots of different brands, Volkswagen, Target, Taco Bell, um, to try to build digital experiences that bake the brand promise into those experiences. So it used to be that we made digital ads and people would click on them or not click on them. And then over time, what we started to do was to build out digital experiences. And when you think about what brands are trying to do in terms of making emotional connections with their customers, imagine what kind of connection they don't make when they're with their customers when the products and experiences that they're building kind of um, say, you know, quietly, this product wasn't meant for you. And so it's a big problem as brands continue to build out products and services that they're doing it in a way that is mindful of all of the people that they're hoping to connect with. Our panel, this is a pretty kick-ass group of people and I've loved meeting them and getting to know them. So um, let's start with Rachel Romano. Rachel, you want to give a little, yeah. Uh, Rachel is a great example of what people kind of now in fancy terms call cognitive diversity, right? So not really, didn't come up as, uh, a technologist or as a developer, uh, instead has a background in, in human behavior. And uh, Rachel day-to-day -day works with the Lookout team here at Microsoft and is focused on um, kind of design choices rather than kind of pixel pushing your actual design and has some incredible experiences at building sort of unseen systems. And she'll talk a little bit about her learnings as those systems were designed and sort of t things that we can take from that experience and apply to it as we go forward. Next, we have Joyce. Joyce is a true UX practitioner and researcher, and as I said, probably the most qualified of all of us to be up here in terms of her background um, kind of in the UX field. She works on, in the Windows division and is very focused on inclusive design, specifically focused on the implications with artificial intelligence. Um, so Joyce and her team are working to build inclusive principles into AI from the start and has a great point of view on how we correct for biases and also adjust systems that have already been developed. It's one thing to start with a fresh sheet of paper and to think about inclusive design as we're starting from the very beginning. What do we do for products or um, you know, systems that we've designed that didn't have inclusive thinking in the beginning and how do we go from here? So Joyce has a lot of interesting ideas about that. Cynthia, all the coffee lovers in the house, I think probably everyone in this room has had about 20 Starbucks while we've been here. There's been a lot of that. Um, Cynthia works at Starbucks. She was at uh, Microsoft for quite some time prior to that and has been sort of a champion of accessibility and really understanding ways to build um, that kind of thinking into the technical side of product development and um, you know she she has some some great stories about how really even at the use case level we can integrate um, some of the requirements that we know to be uh, important to our users and there we go Cindy just you know this is Cindy's doing a double header today she just <laughs> rolled off 
uh, an earlier panel, I'm not sure if any of you guys were there, but um, Cindy literally wrote the book on product development. Um, she came from the Yammer acquisition. Um, and you know she has a lot of accomplishments, but one of the things that is really striking is Cindy's experience with change management and creating a culture where inclusivity can really happen. And that is, I think, what gets at the heart of implementing these new ways of working. It's not so much, you know, understanding what inclusive design is or you know looking for ways that that can happen throughout research but it's really changing culturally um, sort of how teams work and what our priorities are I think you know there used to be sort of a feeling I don't even really know where it came from that 80% was good enough right if we reached 80% of the users that that was sufficient and particularly as we moved, I think, into Agile, you know, everything was sort of, um, you know, we'll put it in the next sprint, let's just get this base case down, you know, let's just hit these, you know, high priority items and we'll iterate from there. And I think what we've seen as a result of that is that some of the design principles that are required to reach different audiences didn't make it into these MVPs and then sort of the horse was out of the barn and it was became unclear about when those should come in. And then as we tried to put them into later and later releases, it got more and more expensive. So um, Cindy will talk a little bit about how we can kind of organize our culture and our teams and our leadership um, to make that happen. So um, big, big welcome to you guys. So Rachel, why don't you kick us off just to kind of set the stage for inclusive design and maybe talk a little bit about um, how it's different than just accessibility. Sure. Um, so I guess most simply put, uh, inclusive design is when it's, it's a process, not a product, and it's a design process where you are designing for as broad an array as possible um, of abilities, of scenarios, use cases, with the ultimate goal of designing a product that's better for everybody. So by designing for the 20, you also capture the 80 rather than the inverse of that. Um, and I, probably the best known example of this would be the handicap ramp curbs. So it used to initially be everything was the step. People in wheelchairs had to travel around until they could find a ramp. Um, but anybody who's ever pushed a stroller or if you're having a cart to pull along, uh, most of us appreciate having that ramp. So that, that's an example of inclusive design. And in terms of dispelling um, the myth sort of that it's lumped in with, with accessibility or even user-centered design, um, user-centered design was basically the idea that humans shouldn't have to change their behavior to accommodate technology. Um, technology should be built with the user first in mind um, and their needs and their behaviors. But when they're talking about said user, that was typically somebody within that 80%. So within a quote unquote normal range of, of abilities, both um, physical and mental. So that's where accessibility would come into play. And so it's like, great, we have a product, now let's think about how to make it accessible. And so you'd add on tools or features. Um, that's very, very different when you're designing from inception for the more, um, Edge, edge cases. So if you're thinking about dyslexia, if you're thinking about somebody with um, impaired motor functions or low or no vision user, by kind of, it's almost like a forcing function to think about um, body mechanics, how our brains work, and use that to start parsing um, nuances in, in behavior and interactions that we don't typically think about. It's a pretty great definition. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks for that. So, you know, one of the things I mentioned just in the upfront, Cynthia, was about how, you know, is inclusive design yet another set of responsibilities that we're going to take and say, okay, you know, for teams that are crunching against a deadline that might feel under-resourced, you know, to say, oh, you know, by the way, you used to have kind of um, this checklist, here's another checklist, you know, here's another set of responsibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how are teams sort of able to manage these kind of quote unquote new requirements? So one of the ways that I've always dealt with this is to not make it a checklist and to not do it at the end. Um, as you move earlier in the development cycle, whether that's moving from when I first started working on accessibility, it was mostly a test function. And then it moved into development and then it moved into specking and, now, and then it's largely in design at this point. But everyone involved in the team has some effort involved in making a product accessible or inclusive in a, a variety of ways. 
my focus is on accessibility. I will use those words interchangeably. I'm sorry, Rachel. Oh, it's <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that we do at Starbucks is to integrate into our agile development process for the Starbucks app. So for every user story that has UI, and not all of them do, some of them are back-end stories, but for every user story that has UI, there's a paired accessibility story. Accessibility actually requires a level of detailed specification that a lot of Agile teams don't do for everything. And so we write detailed accessibility specs that you know, this button needs to have these API values filled out, the string should be this, that's a different string than the visual one, or it's the same, and why. We don't usually put why in the spec, but we have a lot of conversations with our entire team about why those decisions are made. And that acts as a training function. So if you try to set up a brown bag to have your developers come learn about accessibility, well, you better have whiskey because they're not going to come otherwise. That does work really well, though. <laughs> it does, yes. But if you just start going to stand up and asking, so what about that? And how is that going to work with voiceover? And how is that going to work in this scenario? And, you know, my dad makes all the text really big on his phone, and I bet that that's going to overlap and get chopped off. And what, what do we do about that? If you come to stand up and say those things for a couple of months, suddenly other people start saying them too. Mm -hmm. And they don't even realize that they've been trained on accessibility. They just see it as part of product quality or part of good design. Um, so that's really the approach that I've taken is to integrate it deeply into the process that already exists, not try to add something at the end or a checklist or a special this or a complicated that, but just teach the team that it's part of making a good product. And most people want to do a good job. Well, you bring up something interesting, and you know, we've, we talked a little bit about this, but Cindy, you know, I don't know, how many people in the audience have been to any kind of diversity and inclusion training in the past 18 months, right? Like, everyone is <laughs> doing that or will do that. It is, again, kind of part of this um, mantra that I think is being um, sort of, you know, repeated throughout companies, all kinds of companies, that um, diversity and inclusion is good for business. And they'll talk about companies that have different business results as a result of having uh, a workforce that um, brings different ideas. But, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about is that when you think about product teams or project teams in a stand-up, is that as we're bringing people into our design process, from different backgrounds with a more inclusive perspective, what does that do to team dynamics? Does it make it m go more slowly at some points, but more quickly in others? Like, what is your experience? What have you seen? Yeah, well, the, I mean, the fastest working team are a bunch of people who all think alike. You get to the wrong answer really fast that way. <laughs> uh, so yeah, if you bring in other perspectives, you're gonna bring in contention. Uh, and that's, that is true, I'm not gonna say that you won't, but a healthy contention is something that builds better products because you have people asserting and people saying, I'm not sure that that's true. I think that's an assumption. And I think that uh, the folks in the room should never have the answers unless your entire customer base is people in, in room. that room with you. And so when you have people from different perspectives, it's not that you're necessarily saying, uh, we're gonna move faster, or now that we've got someone from each of these check boxes, we've got all the answers. It's that you've got folks that it will occur to them to ask certain questions. And so all of, you know, any product team, you should be looking outside to what your customers need. As you bring in more people, you're asking different questions and, and having people there who can say, this is actually a really important question. This isn't a tax. This is something that is gonna impact a lot of people. And I know because I have had this lived experience with it. So I think, yeah, it does slow things down, but it also gives you a much better product that reaches more people. Yeah, when you think about sort of how much time we sometimes spend iterating yeah. that in fact you could kind of um, average out the cost you know and the time because I think again everyone here is feeling I'm sure um, very constrained mm -hmm. by time and by resources with growing expectations so you know one of the things that you mentioned Cynthia is just like about kind of how these roles are changing and we mm -hmm. are seeing that that you know I think many of us when we came up it was you had research you had um, 
PMs, you had design, development, and test. Mm -hmm. And different um, groups of people with different expertise came in and they said, okay, you're gonna own the requirements, okay, you're gonna own um, kind of documenting this piece, you're gonna do this and you're gonna do that. As we talk about having these teams with more diverse perspectives, also hybrids coming up, right? Mm -hmm. People that have come from environments that were not so structured to say, oh, I did all the UX myself, I did all the design myself, I did all the coding myself. What are these roles? Like, how can we um, ensure that we have the right checks and balances in place, particularly on small teams? So uh, one of the things that, that we've done is to Again, make sure that everyone understands that accessibility and inclusion is actually part of their job. It's not somebody else's job. It's not just a checklist at the end. It's not a set of requirements. Um, that training is really key. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we did was we went out and we met some users. Um, I brought a team of four people to the uh, CSUN conference, which is a big assistive technology conference in uh, Southern California every year. It's sort of the, the big deal for accessibility in the US every year. Um, and we set up a booth. And we had samples of, of coffee and lemon cake. Highly recommend our lemon cake. It's wonderful. Um, I can also attest to that. It's <laughs> wonderful. And so we, uh, we did 53 usability studies with people. Most of, the, most of the users who did our test were blind. We gave them $5 gift cards. And we talked to them, and we listened to them, and we watched them use our application. And um, I, the team consisted of myself, a content manager, uh, an iOS developer, and um, a usability engineer. And the usability engineer wrote all the, all the tests and taught us more or less how to run them. Um, and then we just sat down and we, we had people try our product and we, and we gave them this gift card and had them load it into the app and, and work with it. And we came back with so much data. And it was pretty messy data. It took a long time to parse through it all. But we came back with all of this data and everyone who had that experience of being in the minority as being a person who could see um, was profoundly changed by it. And they came back to our team and were like, no, really. And we didn't even take videos because we didn't want to deal with, with releases. Mm -hmm. But we had people come back from this conference and just talk about what this experience was like and some of the cliffs that people hit where, you know, we actually met the technical requirement, like the API was filled out. It was just completely unusable. And we fixed a lot of that. And it was a, a profound change. Um, our usability people sit with our designers. And so she talked to everybody all day about how this would change the field of design. And we ended up with our entire design team kind of being cheerleaders for accessibility. Um, one of the things that they did was they developed a set of colors. In a lot of companies, design owns a set of um, brand guidelines. So they took our corporate brand guidelines and tweaked some of the colors so that we got high enough color contrast. And then that is the set of colors that we use in our app. And if you don't use those colors, it's a bug. Mm -hmm. So you can enlist everyone in building a culture that takes this seriously and doesn't think of it as a tax or a dumb checklist you have to do at the end. And it doesn't have to involve travel. We do a lot of phone interviews. And folks who are not designers and researchers tend to be note takers. And we, we'll say, you know, it's a simple commitment, you know, 20 minutes, sit, take notes, listen on the phone, you know, it's on speaker, you don't even have to talk. And that's something that has, has also, you know, profoundly mm -hmm. changed people. And typically, um, you know, I came from the Yammer team and we were there, we told all the engineers that for every project you're on, you have a one hour commitment, which consists of two 20 minute phone interviews where you're the note taker and a little bit of prep before and after. And this is one hour that you're going to invest in making a better product. And it was, it was phenomenally valuable. Although to begin, we did have to bribe people. We did have uh, beer Fridays or, or cookie midweek uh, to get people in the door the first time. But once people had done this once, they wanted to do it again. It's just listening to folks and seeing like, no, they really, this is really something that's impacting this person. It's much more powerful than a spec. Yeah, it's interesting when you were talking about something being unusable. And you can sort of in your mind picture someone not being able to open a door to mm -hmm. a restaurant or not being feeling independent. And I think sometimes when we, you know, we, we get to hide sort of far away from our users mm -hmm. in that they're using um, digital products and services, but that kind of sinking feeling that you get in your stomach 
when you watch someone physically struggle to use something that wasn't designed properly you know often we're not confronted with that but you can once you start to see that it is profound profound so we've talked some, about some best practices and Joyce you've been sitting here taking this all in because you know one of the questions that we had for you is even if we do everything sort of right um, and we consider inclusive design from the beginning and we ensure that we have a diverse set of people involved in defining those requirements you know, as we look towards machine learning and AI, which is where you've been spending your time, is there something that could even be baked into the data that could kind of send us into the wrong direction? I think you have a LinkedIn example that's quite powerful. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's about how to recognize that there is exclusion that happens in AI. And I think something that I want to call out before we even talk about AI is just the idea that product designers and makers of technology are often small groups. And something that they're overcoming often all the time is their unintentional bias, right? Some of their mistakes are not at all intended, but are not always considered beforehand to make sure that they're thinking about who is being excluded, are we being inclusive, um, are we thinking about the diverse and large set of people in our customer base that are not necessarily always represented in um, this group of creators, right? Um, with AI, it becomes especially important to think about because that kind of unintentional bias is not necessarily coming from the creators, but coming from data that isn't necessarily um, visible to you, right? It can be really invisible to you that this data can feel really skewed towards certain types of people. And um, that kind of bias can also exponentially grow in a much quicker amount of time with AI. So um, I think for us, what we're trying to do is make sure that it is inclusive as early as we can be, make sure that there is as much diversity in the data as we can get to represent as many people as possible in our customer base. Um, and then keep on iterating over and over again and checking. You'll never be 100% inclusive because the first question people will ask is, who thinks you're being inclusive, right? Who, who are you asking? And I think the, the thing that I always respond to is, yes, you're not gonna be 100% inclusive, but you'll be able to have some check in place or against some of those unintentional biases from your small team, right, your small group. So do you want to talk a little bit about that LinkedIn example? I think it's like staggering. Oh, the LinkedIn, okay, yeah. yeah it's, okay, it's such yeah. a very like concrete sort of way where the data is actually kind of tripping us up, not the interface. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great example because it comes at it from two points, right? One is that we need to be more inclusive in our hiring, right, to have more diversity in our perspectives. Um, and the second is we need to be more inclusive in the way our actual products work, right? So, um, for example, uh, for recruiters who are seeking for more women to hire in technology and in the tech sector, and there is a big push for inclusion to be able to have more and more uh, gender diversity, more types of people um, at working at tech companies. If you put a female name into the, your LinkedIn search box, like Stephanie, the autocorrect will actually say, did you mean Stephen? Because all previous searches had been more commonly gone to the male version of that name, right? <laughs> and so do we want to design for what the past looked like and the intelligence based on what past uh, queries look like? Or do we want to design for what the future looks like for what we want, right? So we need to put at least some social checks in place for the kinds of uh, things that we know may be biased. I mean, you really kind of hit the nail on the head. Like that's a that's working against the tide on so many levels. Um, but you can, I mean, everyone in the room can be like, "Aha! I, I I can see exactly sort of how that could happen." So, Rachel, if you could sort of bust a single myth or bring awareness to um, a single bias, you, what would it be? Um, for me, I guess it's just sort of dispelling the idea that that we should be doing this because it's touchy-feely and politically correct, and it avoids lawsuits. Um, I think that we live in, well, if you put it in the broader cultural context, I think right now everybody's kind of walking on eggshells. You have Me Too, you have Black Lives Matter, you have kids not playing dodgeball because it hurts people's feelings or bullying is encouraged. And so everybody's forced to constantly question their behavior and their beliefs. 
which is good because I think that leads to a more conscientious society. But I think it's also led to some unspoken frustrations. And it's interesting because when you bring up inclusive, you can see people's eyes roll sometimes. And they're putting it in the context of like, OK, let's all play happily together in, in the playground um, with, with unicorns and rainbows. And, and it's really not about that. It's not about touchy-feely. Um, it, it's a good business model, like you said. And it also is common sense. So um, when you're thinking about, uh, I don't know, just think about yourself throughout the course of, of the day, you have different abilities depending on what you're doing. So you are um, vision impaired when you're driving, I hope. <laughs> I hope you're not checking your phone. Um, or at the end of the day, you're exhausted. It's harder for you to pay attention to things and to focus. So maybe your brain um, mimics that of somebody with, with ADD more so than it would at a different time of day. And then you think about aging populations as well. So my grandmother, I think I was telling you, is she's 98. She is vaguely aware of the World Wide Web and the Facebook and the Twitter. Um, but she's never really interacted with technology. She doesn't really care to. You think about baby boomers, you think about Gen X, you think about millennials. We are all going to um, be deeply embedded with technology right up until the day we die or are cybergenically frozen if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and so because of that, our own abilities are going to be impaired, right? You lose vision, you lose hearing. Uh, it's harder for you to manipulate objects. And I don't think, so that, that's where to me it's also a philosophy. Like you don't necessarily want to suddenly be considered impaired or disabled. You just have different abilities. And so to me that's what's kind of cool about inclusive design is that you're thinking about design and interaction from an abilities perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, so kind of to, to your point earlier about the, the color contrast, mm -hmm. it, if you're just designing, I, I think the more natural something is, the less we tend to analyze it. And so if you're a regular sighted person, you're not really thinking about how the brain responds to visual stimuli or the rods and cones in your eyes. You're not breaking down the, the mechanics of the behavior. Um, but when you do, you end up with a much better product. And as we move toward designing for technologies where there is no manual, like you think about voice first, you think about a lot of the things coming down the pike, um, we're going to have to think at that micro level. You know, mm -hmm. conversation, I think, is, is one of the hardest ones because so much of it, you do it instinctually. Um, you're responding to verbal cues, to nonverbal cues. And because of that, you don't actually stop and break down, OK, what did you say? Why? How? When? Um, so, so that's what I think is kind of interesting about inclusive, is it's, it's a philosophy and it's a process that forces good, good design, particularly when you're thinking about things that we don't have a playbook for. Well, yeah. It's, it's, maybe you could share a little bit about the experience that you had building for kind of like sight unseen systems and kind of the learnings. I, you know, Cynthia, you shared your sort of being so impacted by seeing firsthand when systems didn't work. How did you guys go about designing, um, I think, a system that uh, was designed not for a visible interface? Yeah, um, I mean, so, and also, just to be clear, I didn't do the designing on that. Sorry, that was loud. Um, very, very talented people on my team did. And um, so for that, we actually studied non-sighted populations. Um, and really did sort of a, a deep dive in, if, if we're thinking about designing um, voice first, mm -hmm. blind, it makes sense to speak to people with low or no vision because that's how they orient, that's how they gather context. Um, so basically, like, they were a power user. Yeah. And by studying that, we were able to, yeah. I well, can't go into more detail. <laughs> but I think that's an interesting thing, which is, yeah. There's something that's definitely, you know, it's like pretty obvious, like all these women on this panel, you know, looking out into an audience where like the, that gender is like a little bit different, right? And I think that brings up a number of things and we were kind of getting at this and this is where like people kind of get like a little bit nervous. Alistair starting to have like a little speed of sweat, but <laughs> we're going to get into it because, you know, we're here and we might as well. Um, <laughs> talking about the power user, right? One of the reasons why this is kind of coming to light in this context is because, you know, as technologists and, you know, engineers and teams like that, we designed systems the way that we thought that they made sense. 
and we were always bringing our personal point of view. Even if we tried to say, okay, let's have a range, let's talk about people um, you know, that might want to have different modalities, let's look at people that want to use a maps view, a directions view, you know, what you started to see then was like lots of different choices, no one really kind of putting a line in the stand saying, okay, this is the way our product looks, it's like, okay, let's develop these personas, you know, what if it's someone who wants to do it this way, and you know, everyone's like, this is Sally Jones, and she's a you know time-starved mom, you know, and she, you know, like they write out these personas, yeah. and then we're like designing for Sally Jones, this time-starved mom, um, and we've seen those kind of things. So this idea of like really changing who the power user is is important, and that if we kind of move our aperture out a little wider, we might find a power user that is really going to kind of push everyone forward. Maybe, Cynthia, you could talk a little bit about um, the baristas as power users in some of your <laughs> system design. So um, one of the things that Starbucks does, that one of the reasons I really love working there, is um, we have a really different employee base than a company like Microsoft does. Most of our employees work in stores. And we offer a program where baristas or any full-time employee who doesn't have a bachelor's degree can get a bachelor's degree online through Arizona State University. We pay for it. Uh, and a great many people have taken advantage of that. Another thing that we do is that with, with some of those students, we offer them internships at our corporate office, and, um, and we sometimes hire them. Um, there's, I work with quite a few people who used to be baristas who are now in professional jobs and who went through that program or the earlier version of our educational program. Um, there's a, a gentleman who works on the same team I do who just graduated a couple days ago, and uh, we're always going to him and asking him, so, you know, if we change this, like, how's that going to impact things in the store? Because we actually have, we have the set of our customers, but we also have this, we live in this space where we're partly physical and partly digital, and we have operations impacts from the things that we do in our application. So how is this going to impact the barista experience, and how is this going to impact differently in, say, a store in a small town that's mostly drive-through? How is that going to impact in a very space-constrained store in New York City? How are these things going to, to um, change in that physical environment? And having people who have lived that is invaluable. And that's, it's sort of a different kind of diversity because it's more of a, a, a role-based or job or even class diversity um, that you don't run into necessarily when you're making knowledge worker products. And it's been, it, it's been really exciting to work in a field where there's this whole other aspect of physicality and um, serving customers directly. But I think that brings up an interesting sort of challenge for ourselves is like who we think the real power users are. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of in my field, you know, one of the things that we're always looking at is kind of like social media usage, right? And so everyone's like, oh, it's like, these kids that are on Snapchat that are learning all these things, when in fact, you know, people, um, you know, women that are in their 50s are actually like killer at using all of the advanced features because they're, you know, really understand kind of communication kind of in that way. So, you know, I, I think it's oftentimes we um, get an assumption about who the users are, who the power users are, and then start designing right at them. So I think if there's anything that we can take away, it's that maybe we should ask ourselves a few more questions about who these users are and um, who the personas are that we're designing for. So, Cindy, what do you think, you know, you've, you've had the benefit of being in lots of different types of organizations, working on lots of different kinds of teams. You know, what do you think that leadership, you know, across the board, company leadership, you know, um, technical leadership, product leadership can do? Um, if we could do a, make one single change, you know, I often think that. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to leave here and do 10 things differently. Like, I might leave here and do one thing differently. Um, what do you think that we could do to kind of... Um, bring back to our organizations this idea of inclusive design beyond just it's good for business. Right. Well, you know, and Rachel said this, we all have different abilities at different times. And I think the, if there's one change, it would be that everyone has to adopt one of these for some period of time and work with it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, you know, Microsoft has a, a 2G lab, so you can experience what terrible internet is like. Uh, Heroku, who's now owned by Salesforce, has Remote Week, 
where people have to go somewhere else and work for a week somewhere else so that they can experience what the collaboration experience is like. Um, I broke my wrist a few years ago. I spent a long time being a one-handed person. That was incredibly valuable. There were a lot of things that we changed in, in the Yammer app because like, this is impossible to do with one hand. Uh, and some people always have that capability. Um, I've seen, uh, jokingly, but it's actually a pretty good idea, uh, tipsy usability testing. People who go to bars <laughs> for consumer products especially. Go to a bar, have someone who's had a few use your app. That's what it's like when you're jet lagged or, or you know, ADD or you know, cognitively disabled. Like, but to commit to saying, we're going to do this. Uh, I made my team do mobile only for a week when our mobile apps were in terrible condition. Um, as humans, we're, we're good at being profoundly selfish, and, and we should tap into that. It's nice to say we should all care about other people, and, and we should. But honestly, it's, it's easier to just force someone to be another person, and then that, that changes them. That you go forward and you say, I still remember what it's like to use all my apps one-handed. And you mentioned mm -hmm. class diversity. I grew up without money. I still remember what it's like to like hesitate and be like, what is this going to cost finally? Like I remember as a kid panicking, like, am I going to have enough after sales tax? So just like, things like that impact how confidently people can use products. And so if it's, you know, maybe you have to go out and tell someone like, do your shopping. This is all the money you have in an envelope that you're going to have a lot more sense of, oh, Instacart is really scary if I don't know what my total bill is going to be. So enforcing that, just saying everyone is going to do this. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily have to say this is how you do it. In fact, I think top-down mandates of everyone will do this and here's how are doomed to fail. But top-down cultural mandates of everyone will do this however it makes sense, but I will make sure you do it. And modeling that. Right? Yeah, and modeling and, it. And you That's really right. doing it. You, the exec, should be in that 2G lab or doing something <laughs> one-handed or doing mobile only for a week and, and talking about your experience. Yeah. Yeah. So Joyce, I'm going to give you like this big, the big question, right? Which is, but where do you think this is sort of all headed? In that, you know, again, it was like five years ago, maybe seven years ago, we were talking about user-centered design. Mm -hmm. You know, now we're talking about inclusive design. Like, is this a temporary stop until sort of we're all getting a very customized interface that is, you know, served up to us by an algorithm that knows what our um, strengths are? Somewhere every QA tester in the world is shuddering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there, there's a lot of people who are, you know, who think that, hey, the ideal scenario would be that day when um, we don't need inclusive design. Inclusive design is so baked in by default, and everyone feels so included that we wouldn't need it, right? But uh, the journey to that place looks really long, and it looks really vigilant, right? That you have to continually check um, who is being excluded, and how do we make these meaningful trade-off decisions, right? Not everyone can be included all the time, but how do we not get blindsided by people we didn't know were being excluded? So can we plan that along the way? Can we make really great trade-off decisions that are saying, um, this is actually um, on purpose. This is something that we are making a decision about um, for now. In the future, that might look differently. But I think like for us to understand what inclusive looks like in the future would be that, yes, it would be by default baked into everything. Everything would work perfectly for your special need at any given time, at any given day, whether you're blind, whether you're in the full sunlight, whether you're driving. Um, and uh, it would be adaptive. It would be fluid, right? It would be something that would be so ultimately personalized to you. And knowing that that's our North Star, knowing that AI may be able to power us there, um, is something that makes us really hopeful about what Inclusive can do for the company and for design overall. Well, that's a great sort of place to land it in terms of kind of the role and the leadership role that Microsoft is kind of playing in this space across the board. Because um, I can say this lovingly because I don't work at Microsoft, so I'm just, I'm not being compensated to provide this point of view. But you know, <laughs> one is like if you read the inclusive design guidelines, and we have a link to it um, uh, kind of at the end of this deck, and I encourage everyone to check it out. It is, I would say, across the board, a real thought leadership piece. And do you think that there's a reason why Microsoft is kind of, I, I would say, out ahead of this? Um, in terms of kind of your, you know, we've been talking about that over lunch, you know, kind of the history where you've been. Why, why is this happening now and why is that happening here? Oh, well, I'm 
I'm really excited to answer it. Yeah, I think it's because um, we have this really great CEO who prioritizes accessibility, right? And I come from mobile design, and um, every time we started thinking about accessibility, we started thinking about how it is increasingly relevant as we have more devices, as they become more mobile, that accessibility is just more and more relevant for our everyday lives, right? So one thing we had thought about was how do we start thinking about voice UI or conversational UI? Um, how do we start baking in new technologies? These may be new technologies, but they're actually really old interactions, right? People have been using speech and voice in their interactions with their um, either screen readers, uh, dictation services, all sorts of accessibility products have been uh, basically gathering data, giving us feedback on what is intuitive, like what works for people. So I think that the fact that um, Satya is such a champion for accessibility has really raised us to a point where we can say um, inclusive design is a place where we can use accessibility um, as well as other types of inclusion as a generative place to be inspired from, right? Not necessarily a, a place that from compliance. A place of inspiration. That's huge. Do you want to share a little bit of, you know, you, it, it seems like you've had some um, experience with end users that have kind of adapted some of their own technologies and maybe, you know, given us some, some indications of where things could go. Because I think looking at new power users as a source of inspiration for unlock for new interactions is really, you know, if we leave here with one thought, it's like, okay, that's the thing, which is, um, you know, people will um, contribute to our product development, whether we're listening or not. Do you want to? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, you know, next week is uh, World Accessibility Day, and um, we'll be announcing something that I can't talk about today, but I think something really interesting to start thinking about is, like, um, look at the passion and inspiration of people who are creating, like, hacked workarounds, right? The things that they have unmet needs where they are not able to access what they want and what they need. Um, and they create their own setups. So I'll give you an example. Um, I just I felt really inspired by uh, a bunch of gamers who are mobility impaired and uh, could not use kind of the fine uh, motor skills of like that the Xbox controller necessitates, right? Um, and so they had created the most beautiful setup of joysticks, large buttons, all sorts of different types of. Um, kind of like controllers that they knew that they could use and um, hack them all together to be able to access what they really wanted to do, which is just um, feel passionate about gaming, right? And um, you see these stories all the time, like what does that mean for our workplace, right? All sorts of people in our workplace are not being met, uh, have needs that are not being met, right? And they create these beautiful hacks all the time around what works for them. Like I saw the other day in a Starbucks, this woman had set up like a shipping crate um, and a bunch of like little cups as a way to create a more ergonomic station for her laptop, right? And so there's a lot of ways that once you start looking at what are people's um, workarounds, and when you look at people with like extreme needs or what we used to call edge cases, I think that um, you start to see like more motivation for those workarounds, right? There's a lot of people who might uh, benefit from the same type of setup, um, but there's, they're not maybe as motivated or inspired to create um, like this type of hack. So um, yeah, I think I was sharing that at lunch and I got really excited. So. No, it's very <laughs> inspiring. I mean, I think that's, it's interesting because we have all these conversations, but like some of it is like back to being very simple, right? Which is like walk a mile in a person's shoes and like see what that's like, right? Look at these most um, natural ways of people interacting. And then I think look for new power users um, so that we're not talking about Sally Jones as we write these personas. <laughs> I absolve you all of having personas, by the way. You could go forth oh. and feel free to not to I not mean, that's have. a big absolution yeah, right there, yeah. so uh, yeah. we'll take that. So <laughs> behavior, be, you understand Wait. what users are doing. Behaviors no. are important. Demographic profiles of oddly gendered, oddly named people <laughs> with assumptions <laughs> of what you think they do are yeah. not helpful out the window yeah <laughs> so we do have a few minutes I know it's like very late I know everyone's been kind of here getting like their brains filled for days and days so I can see 
your brains, your full, full brain. So um, if anyone has any questions, we'd be happy to take them. How do you, a lot of software engineering is moving to sort of a process engineering model, right? DevOps, where you do small batches very frequently, and then when you deliver the software, you make measurements, and those measurements then go to modify the software. And so the question is, are, can you think of any good metrics, things that we should be measuring to make sure that we're doing the right thing or where we kind of get things off track, that we can measure that to go fix our process? Um, I think for me, um, one thing I've noticed is not necessarily always the metrics, but um, who you're asking those metrics of, right? So there's a lot of people who use a satisfaction scores or feedback from their users. Um, are they asking the right users? Are they asking a broad sampling of their users? Are they making an effort to reach the people that aren't always reached by surveys or by your traditional means, right? Um, and I think that might be one way to go about metrics. Um, but there might be other ways that are actually working really well. Yeah. Um, I'm a big so. fan of did you ask someone who was not like you? <laughs> Just like that's your, you know, pick at least two dimensions of differentness, you know, race, gender, socioeconomic, job title, show them this thing and see. It's like it's very blunt, but Mm -hmm. Honestly, like we're not anywhere near that bar in most instances. So if you've done that, you're better than you were. And targeted okay. usability can be another thing, mm -hmm. um, where you get a group of users who, who meet a particular profile or go to a place where those people hang out and get information from them and maybe talk to the same users multiple times as you make improvements. Um, looking at app store feedback can be another good way to, to find information. It's interesting, though, because we've all mentioned actually talking to people. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think it's interesting because with metrics you tend to think of like, okay, where's a dashboard I can look at and, and find out like how many minutes spent in the app. And mm -hmm. so metrics in general, I think it's interesting to add in almost like a face-to-face -face conversational element because we talk about this on my team. Like if you're using time spent in an app as a metric, um, is that good time or bad time? Right, yeah. like maybe it just takes me forever to compose an email because Outlook is terrible or Gmail is terrible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't, it, it can be interpreted multiple ways. So sometimes, uh, yeah, I don't think anything replaces face-to-face. Yeah. -face. But Cynthia, just a top line question, you know, mm -hmm. in your role, like what are you measured on? Do you have, as a entity or as an organization, do you have specific KPIs that at the end of the year you'll say, you know, our team was successful because we... So um, I've only been in this role for 18 months, so a lot, of, a lot of my measurement has been about bringing the team along and training and the fact that people are asking the questions. Right, now up, they're starting to have to say, ask okay, now. let's see. Um, and, you know, we also do some, some QA testing and usability testing, and it's, it's, it's a little more qualitative at this point, um, but we see clear improvement in all of those qualitative measures. Did I answer your question? Hi, so my question has to do with being inclusive with our global partners, and I'm curious to know uh, how to be better stewards of including our global partners when it comes to product development. Um, you know, I work for Starbucks, and we're trying really hard to be a, a good global steward, working with our partners in China and EMEA, CAP, and um, sometimes it's difficult because we want to come up with a solution that's maybe, quote, a global solution, and yet maybe our China partners uh, need some variation on that. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of curious how you've been challenged or how you've tackled that. Is that for me or is that for, for the Microsoft people? Any, anybody, <laughs> yeah. I'll let you guys answer it first because I, I, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Well, for me, I feel like, because I have worked on the both localization and accessibility, and I feel like those are almost two sides of the other side, I mean, you know, the other side of the coin for inclusive design, right? Like, localization can often look like an after the um, product is done tax. That's something that you just retrofit per country, per culture, a set of requirements, right? And I think that if you have a more inclusive approach, it might look like from the beginning, from um, the start, uh, you might have something that's globally ready, um, but then what does that look like in specific regions of the area? Like, and how do we bring in those perspectives um, earlier, perhaps, or even just like as a part of strategic 
um, points in the development process. So, um, like, you can localize, which is also really important, um, but that's after the fact, right? There's also before the fact, which is inclusive. Thank you. I didn't know if I was speaking for you all, but. <laughs> yeah, no, I think timing, to, to your point about mm -hmm. that, uh, one of the things, even if you think about the role of research, a lot of times we design something and then research it via mm -hmm. like testing, um, thinking more in terms of like discovery research and what if prior to doing any design or ideation, you just go out into very different parts of the world, um, see what's universal, see what's different, mm -hmm. see what's culturally contextual. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, th I think timing is, is a really interesting kind of point. And supporting customization and skinning is another way that you can tackle that, right? So the, the, the basic engine of a product probably does the same things, but you may want it to be a different color in a different country, or you may want different imagery or, um, sl you know, the, for the UI widgets to look a little bit different and making it so that those kinds of customizations can happen without having to build whole separate versions of things can be another way to approach that. Hi, thanks again so much for your time on the panel. So my question is, when collecting user feedback, specifically from underrepresented groups, how do you incentivize against self-selection bias? Meaning, you know, let's say you're going to go to a bunch of Latino um, users, given that I'm Latino, that's kind of the example that comes to mind. How do you go against the fact that maybe there's only a certain percentage of people that would even be willing to answer surveys or give you feedback in the first place? So I think um, one of the things that I do is try and focus on, this is the problem we're trying to solve, and kind of pitch it as, I'm trying to learn more about people who are trying to solve this kind of problem. And when you target the problem, it tends to, you'll get people who recognize it, like, oh, I have that problem, I want to talk to you. Oftentimes, f for smaller populations, whether that's uh, people of underrepresented races or just even smaller uh, populations, I'll tend to have a few people first and at the end of, a, of an interview say, who else is like you that I should talk to? And typically, after a good conversation, people will intro me. Um, and, and actually, over the phone, what it usually is, is I'd love to talk to more people who might have you know, it, the same kinds of experiences and perspectives. Um, if I send you an email, would you be willing to make some intros for me? And people almost always say yes. Mm -hmm. And the way you make them actually do that is you, you write the entire thing along with the, you know, hi, this is Cindy. I had a great conversation with her. Don't worry. She's not trying to sell you anything, dash, dash. This is what she's trying to learn, dash, dash. Here's her <laughs> contact information. Yes. So the person in question literally just has to copy and paste into a new email message. And for smaller populations, I tend to get most of my interviews that way. I might, you know, by hook or crook, get five people, but then I might get 20 from those five. And going to a location where people are already yeah. can, can also work. And that might just be a local meetup. You know, you don't necessarily right. have to go to San Diego. But San Diego's lovely. Um, and having gifts can help. and even very small gifts, mm -hmm. and everybody likes food. Yeah. Um, like very simple things that make people feel <laughs> lemon cake. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Make Everyone. people feel welcome and included. Yeah. Can, make them Twitter friends too. Yeah. Yeah. Last one. I, oh, sorry. Well, I was just gonna. I think it's like such a great question, especially when you start thinking about AI and diversity, because that is a group that. Um, like you just lose trust in giving up your data, especially if you're an underrepresented group, um, thinking that you'll be more vulnerable for, like, for giving up your data, right? And I think just things like this, right? Uh, events where we can share and educate about like the importance of more diversity in data and in all of our products is really important in helping people understand like their role in helping to improve products. Hi. Um, so when I'm developing desktop software <clears throat> and I'm talking to a designer or a PM and I say, you know, look what happens when I change to high contrast settings on Windows. Look what happens to the UI you've designed for me. And they kind of go, eh. <laughs> That's frustrating for me because I want, I want to be able to do those, you know, do the right thing, make it look good, but also have it accessible. Uh, you know, change the DPI settings on the computer. Like, look what this looks like now. How do you, do you have any techniques for getting buy-in on that, like getting them to say, okay, yeah, this is actually important. This is not just the 80-20. This is, we don't care about those people because we're just trying to get it out the door. 
This is where the uh, uh, profoundly selfish enforced conditions works really mm -hmm. well, um, especially if you can bring in data. So I actually had a similar case a number of years ago with uh, when I was running a design team, uh, and our CSS was all beautifully optimized for Mac and Chrome, and it looked terrible on Windows. This was before I joined Microsoft, and 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 designers are all kind of collectively shrugged. And we had a couple of Windows laptops, and I said, you are all working in Windows for the next week. <laughs> and they did. And they're like, this is terrible. And I was like, this is how 63%, whatever, a big number, of our customers experience the product you work on every day. This thing that you think is terrible is what a lot of people are experiencing. So if you have pride in your work, you'll fix it. And, and they I, did. I think, too, one of the things you guys brought up, which is so powerful, too, is really looking at a human being mm -hmm. and saying, I think this is good enough for you. Because when yeah. you're kind of saying like, oh, I can ship this the way that it is, it's like, it's sort of easy, it's kind of like, it's easy not to, it's easy to decline an invitation, you know, sort of on Facebook, you just decline, mm -hmm. you don't have to face it. Mm -hmm. But when in fact, you know, they're hoping that I, they never see someone who's right. gonna look at it that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Kelly, you are telling her that looking at the <laughs> app in this way is fine and she should just be happy that she has software. Uh, bug bashes can be <laughs> another, another good thing. I've, I've done this in a few different groups is uh, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving or July 5th when everybody's tired, just say, okay, everybody's using high contrast today. And ag again, you'll, you'll hear me talk about food a lot, like bring popcorn, make it an interesting thing, have bug bounties, that can, be, that can work, or um, everybody draws a disability out of a hat and you're working like that every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, those, those can really build empathy. And a as you were saying, there's someone in your office who's colorblind. It's very common. There's someone in your office who has a variety of different disabilities. It's very common. And not everyone's happy disclosing, but if you have someone who is, who can say, I'm your coworker, I'm not some mm -hmm. weird person off of in some other place, and you're making my life difficult, that mm -hmm. is incredibly powerful. Yeah, we used to do, hey, Ron, can you see this? Uh, <laughs> yeah. For the, for the colorblind, uh, uh, otherwise very advantaged uh, PM partner. But it was, it was like a funny way to get him like, oh, right, right. Yeah. Ron cannot see this. There are lots of Rons. So we, <laughs> we should fix lots of things so that other people can use this. Well, thank you. Hi. Um, the, uh, when you were explaining the LinkedIn example on search that, um, uh, was very interesting. So in the world of AI, when we're trying to, you know, solve problems that previously were unobtainable, uh, you know, for us, how do we correct the social biases that those algorithms will inevitably produce without introducing our own biases? Yeah. I, I mean, it's a challenge. I don't have an answer to, like, like yeah. how would you, and maybe you can't say, but how do you correct something like that? Yeah, I think that's <laughs> something that across the industry, like, uh, you know, that's something that is not solved and will, won't yeah. have one solution, right? Okay. Um, there's a lot of like ways people are exploring and thinking about how do we correct for that. Um, and I think there's a couple of different like sides that you can correct from. Um, the one side that we know of that is um, like, much more approachable and has a lot less questions of ethics involved um, has more to do with the data. The algorithmic side often has to do with a lot of other types of biases um, and we have like five different types of biases related to AI and we use them as different problem sets and we even have like empathy moments and stress test questions if you look on our website um, microsoft.com slash inclusive. Um, and uh, it's a way for people to start thinking about the different ways to kind of slice up what bias means, because um, it's just, it's so huge, right? And you, it can really break down any conversation into like really existential questions that we don't have a place in answering, right? right. So some of it's about like large ethical questions, what human nature is, and some of them are specific um, AI-related problem sets, right? So some of it has to do with data, diversity in data, the way you treat data, the way data is labeled. Um, and then on the other side is the algorithmic side, which can be more complex. But also just putting in social, social checks is really important. So yeah, it goes Thank way you. deep, yeah. yeah. 
Thanks for coming. I hope you dug it. It was great to see you. And uh, again, I'm so pleased to have met each and every one of you. So smart, so caring, and you know, again, 80%. I, I have to say, I've been guilty of saying if we get 80%, <laughs> That's pretty good, and you know, as a result of this conversation, um, my point of view has changed, and I hope that that's the same for some of you.